so much. Well, thank you. Um, I always said when I was uh, undergrad, if I don't make it in biology, I would love to be a tour guide. And um, fortunately, periodically in my life, I get to be both. And so I'm speaking as a biologist, but a little bit of what I'll do today is give you a tour of our own place here at Gordon. This, um, Suzanne did describe that this came out of a Center for Christian Studies grant that I've had for two years. And um, it's been just a wonderful joy. So I will actually give you a little bit of history of Gordon as a, as a place and some things that are going on. And then I'll talk about the activities that have been a part of that grant. And then some things uh, where we might be going institutionally using this information. Um, so, I, in an overview, I'll ask why a sense of place matters. One of the things as an institution that we're focused on is making people into global leaders. Why should we care about our little area that we have uh, when that's one of our goals? I'll tell a little bit about property history and the impact of hydrologic change. Because I am a wetland ecologist, it is a particular joy to be at Gordon. Some of you who are not wetland ecologists might not appreciate, and I'll try and hand you some of that joy. And we will uh, particularly look at the parking lot. This will not be the same. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> then we will actually talk a little bit about what I did with the fellowship, some other campus endeavors, and a vision for the future. I'm going to spend much less time on this first question, why should we work on a sense of place and love at land, of land than I originally intended? And I would love to have more discussion if, in fact, you're not on board. I did think I might be preaching to the choir. The people who are likely to come are likely already to believe it matters where we live in the physical world. They may be people who pay attention to the whole history of the Israelites being given land as an inheritance and all the rules about protection of land and the year of Jubilee and how it mattered where you were and the covenants that had to do with land. I anticipated that this particular group would be people who care about the impact of a love of land and sense of place on the next generation. And in fact, some of our uh, reason for wanting to care about land or have a sense of place comes from scripture, from verses like, uh, like this one. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made, so they are without excuse. Or Job 12, 7 through 10, ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds of the air and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Now, you're pretty educated by that time. Which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. In these verses, we see that creation testifies to the creator and glorifies the creator and that God cares about the rest of the creation in addition to humans. So I'm assuming that you know those things and that many of you I already know from conversation are fans of Wendell Berry, Annie Tillard, or John Muir, the great writers uh, who describe natural places in such beautiful language. In fact, John Muir describes uh, his experiences in the wilderness as worshipful moments in a cathedral made by God. But there are practical reasons for wanting to further such, um, such a sense of place. In his 2004 book, Last Child into the Woods, Richard Louvre describes the crying need of modern people to experience a sense of place 
particularly via unstructured experiences in nature. He calls the modern generation the third frontier. In 1893, the American frontier was declared closed by the historian Frederick Turner. That meant that rapid expansion of European immigrants across the continent had ended. That opened the second frontier. Until the end of the baby boomer generation, almost all Americans had some relative in extended family or close family that lived in a rural community. That is no longer the case. In 1993, the federal government ended its annual survey of agrarian communities. This was because the number of people who lived on farms had gone from 40% of Americans in 1900 to 1 1.9% in 1990. That's the end of the next era. And we are now in an era in which people are remarkably separated from land. And with the advent of that and the rise of electronics as communication and entertainment, the world our children are experiencing is radically different than the world Americans have experienced in the past. This has raised a lot of problems, and one of them is um, a, a separation and a misunderstanding of nature itself that has impacts for our ability to deal with large global issues such as environmental degradation and loss of species. For example, many children have a better understanding of rainforest species than of species that live in their own suburban or urban neighborhoods. Because of this, nature is other and not here. They are unable to see that daily decisions that they make have an impact on the rest of the world. And it leads to an ironic disjunct where people both are tremendously afraid of nature and also are not afraid when they ought to be. I call this second part the Disneyfication of nature. You ought to be afraid of wild elk and polar bears. People are not at all. You should not be afraid of common garden spiders and the garter snake. People are terribly. This, in part, comes out of a lack of experience, an unstructured experience with nature. So, I realize that you are the choir, and I appreciate your coming anyway. <laughs> and I hope that the pictures that we have in the rest of the talk make up for that. But a sense of place and unstructured time in nature encourage moral, intellectual, and emotional maturity and problem solving. It also encourages conservation, including conservation of resources and species in other parts of the world. Now, that's my little plug, but let's look at some cool pictures. Now, I have to thank John Beauregard for helping me get some of these from the archives. This is a 1952 picture, aerial view of the campus. I don't know how good it looks to you there. It looks a lot better on my screen. But let's just uh, look at this. You can see Koi Pond. This is Gull Pond. This is 128 coming up here. 128 had been built only the year before this picture was taken. And Gull Pond was dug during that building as a borrow pit because it is a natural sand deposit. I'll tell you another story about Gull in a minute. This is the, what is now the main quad, and I want to point out this area down here. When the Prince family owned the estate before Gordon moved here in 1952, uh, the main house is here, Frost Hall. This is Wood Hall, and Wynn Library is going to be built right here. The Prince family used this as a polo field and this lower one as a paddock and secondary polo field. They had a pump house down here that pumped water from this area that otherwise would have been a very marshy area over to what is now the Parsons Hill complex. When 120 was built, 
that was the end of that pumping. And ever since then, this whole area of the campus has become wetter. Since I like water, I don't mind, but some of you will see why you mind as we go. Now, this is another picture. Uh, we see uh, a view of Woodhall, and we see just a different angle also from 1952. Um, and this one, a little bit more recent, I think this is from 1971, we can see this paddock has begun to grow up and we'll follow that and we'll follow what's happening right over here as this is a big mowed area and that's where Gedney will soon be. This is right there and you can see buildings starting to fill in. In, the 19, in 1971, to see that traffic coming in is very different, and this was called the bowl. Several of the older faculty have talked about the bowl up, uh, up here. AJ and the other um, things are not up here at all, okay? Now, this is from 1973 from a completely different angle. Koi Pond is down here. Here's Lane Student Center. You can see the quad. I want you to notice this out here, which has almost no vegetation around it. And in fact, today looks very, very different than that. Um, and then, and also this area up here, which is along that Hull Street Pond, is very different than this as well. Okay, taken from another angle, we can see in this picture from 1976, notice how this secondary paddock is now no longer a paddock at all. It's grown into a forest, unfortunately it is so wet that it's uh, really got a lot of purple loosestrife and Phragmites, the common reed, an invasive species I'll talk about in a minute coming in, in here. Um, and yeah, that's the area between, behind the road halls and along the highway. Okay, this, in this shot from 1986, I chose this because of this. Oh my gosh, guys, look at that. Are you getting what that is? Oh man, look. <laughs> this is the parking lot right there. And what's very neat about this is right, if you draw a line right there, that's where the blacktop is. This is all blacktop. And this part is not. So that strip right there is a floating mat. When I first arrived, I have some, uh, some students did a film and I walked out in waders and stood on it and hopped up and down. And we had, but I don't know what happened to that film. <laughs> Um, but this to the back, one time I, wa I went out with students, I have some pictures of myself with students out here, and I was, uh, when this was dry enough that there was no standing water, I was hip deep in muck at a tree right there. And so this is silt of unknown depth. <laughs> and I, I never went to back with students because I didn't want to end up being the bog woman of Gordon College. <laughs> The, for those of you who follow, you know, bog people stories. <clears throat> okay, this is a 1996 photo, and uh, it's just a gorgeous picture. This is the Hull Street Pond. You can see that there. Um, and it's just a very nice picture. You can see the AJ lot is built already at this point. Okay. This one shows uh, a nice picture of Gull, and there is a story that I've always been told about how uh, when they're digging Gull, and some of the uh, people have been on faculty for a long time might be able to tell more about this, but um, this is the level of the water table, and so they'd had to pump and pump and pump to keep it dry while they were digging, and at one point, you overwork your pump and you can't do it anymore. And there was a truck down there, several guys down there, and a big piece of moving equipment. They were able to get a chain on the truck and, and the guys got out, but there is a big piece of moving equipment down in the bottom of Gaul that remains. Apparently there was a certain amount of scrambling occurring and I'm, for, I'm glad I wasn't in on that. And then this is uh, 19, Back to a 1978 picture, it just gives you a good picture of that. You can see that this section looks uh, pretty different. Um, it's just a nice view. I, you, won't, you can't see the very top of the picture, 
but if you could, you'd be able to get a sense that we are only two miles from the ocean, and from us on out is a big, flat area uh, with a lot of ponds. Now, in 1998, uh, Gordon went in and put a lot of land into conservancy, several hundred acres into conservancy with the towns of, of uh, Hamilton, Manchester by the Sea, and Essex County Greenbelt, and the trustees of reservations. And um, the reality is that 90% of the campus is not buildable because of wetlands, wetland regulation, and wetland buffers. And so a uh, great deal of that conservancy land is not buildable land. But this is what makes up the Gordon and Chebacca Woods. So it's labeled Gordon Woods from our end and Chebacca Woods from Chebacca Road end. And it has a series of trails that predate the conservancy. You can also see the number of ponds. One of them, I think it's gravelly, is the water supply for the town of Manchester by the sea. And so there's a lot of restricted use on that. There are five great ponds on this uh, Property great ponds are greater than 10 acres. Koi is about 26 acres, just to give you a picture of which about 10 are, are water lilies. And so, um, <laughs> which it, that was not intended to be funny. That's just a fact about koi, but, um, but yes. And so you, you sort of get the picture. Um, okay, now what did I do for the last two years? Uh, I did four different activities that occurred on semesters and then two other activities. The first was in the fall of 2004 where I did something called the Genesis Project. I invited local churches to a Gordon Woods open house uh, with tours. I worked with this student, Ed Camp, who's standing here in front of a hemlock beach forest that you would see if you were walking down toward Gaul. He did an independent study and designed a uh, guided tour. We trained student tour guides, and we had about 130 people come to take the tours on a Sunday afternoon. And it was just a beautiful day, and it went very well. And it, it left us with a product of this guided tour that we could work up and use at other times. Here's another student who gave tours, who's standing near the culvert, going to the back of Koi. Very often, if you ever see tennis balls, when you're walking down toward Gaul and you pass uh, the culvert where Koi is, and as you'll see tennis balls, that's not because people walk down there with tennis balls. It's because the old tennis court out by the highway is on a wetland and water goes, people's lost balls move their way back through that parking lot marsh and make their way into Koi. <laughs> so uh, if you're not getting the power of hydrology by now, you will by the end of the talk. Here's another nice picture of Koi. And this is a contrasting picture of Gull, just so that you can see some differences. We have other water on the campus, and I myself work at, uh, have a specialty in wetlands that dry, if you can imagine that. And here's one of them. <laughs> That is a vernal pool. Now, this is located, if you were going up the driveway to, the, to Wilson House, this is a beautiful, in a little glen onto the side, just a fabulous little vernal pool. It dries turtles in there, breeding amphibians, all kinds of stuff. Out here, you see um, one of my students and my son out helping collect data, the student is holding a spotted salamander, and that's one of the things that I work on with my students. And this is a student who's in that area that's near Gedney, right on Grapevine, taking water quality measurements. This area has subsequently grown up, and so that has a lot of purple loosestrife. And I just want to make a comment that I'll talk about invasive species a number of times here. Um, just to give you a picture about why it matters. For plants alone, Massachusetts has 1,538 native plant species, but it has 1,276 non-native introduced species, of which an alarming number are out of control. So this is um, hundreds, over, you know, 
of species that are encroaching anytime you open up an area. And we, one of the things that we have seen on campus is that most of the plant species invasions are in the cluster developed areas. That is, they're along Koi, along the parking lot marsh, they're around behind Bennett, around the Hull Street, open side, but they are not primarily in the areas of the woods where the woods are solid. The Gordon and Tobacco Woods is about 400 acres. It's the largest undeveloped land in Wenham and one of the premier conservation pieces on the whole North Shore. So it's an incredible resource that is relatively pristine. Well, pristine with a small p. <laughs> now, let's watch the parking lot. Oh. Some of you remember this, and some of you might be too new to recognize this. Um, this was what it I took this when I first came. This was my first year when I had students out there, what lives in the parking lot. Look at that. We would be right out there, you know, in our waders. Uh, and now today, this is what it looks like. It does have a lot more wet, actual wetland plants. It's missing a lot of blacktop. And it has, unfortunately, a, a large number of invasive species as well. The second thing that I did was uh, a networking meeting with conservation professionals. This was by invitation only. It was in the spring of 2005. And we um, met to discuss the state of the campus and to get all the stakeholders in the Gordon Tobacco Woods online. So we had members of the town conservation commissions come. The thing that was most interesting was that the people who were experts on, on invasive species thought we were, we were still doing pretty well. We might need to do some preventative things, but we were doing pretty well and it looked pretty good. But the people that represented towns, when they talked about land management, they meant trail maintenance, avoiding vandalism and signage. And there was no sense of research, censusing what was there, or prevention of invasions by species. Invasive species are not only plants, and we have two really big insect problems coming in. We've got beech scale, which is taking over all along Tobacco Road, and we have hemlock, woolly adelgid, which is taking over the whole North Shore and decimating hemlock forests. And we are looking at some major changes in our forests in the next 10 years as trees die due to these two pests. Okay, but that's not to leave on an unhappy note because actually it was a very helpful meeting and we're sort of in touch with people in the conservation com community. Then the following fall I did a two-part activity where I worked with teachers. The, the thing that was nice was that I was able to offer this at almost no cost to the teachers because of the grant. <coughs> and we talked about using the outdoors to teach science. And I um, got a lot of teachers from Lynn. This led to a relationship to, with teachers at the Ford School in Lynn, and I'll talk about what we did with them in a minute. But that was really, really neat. I, it had not occurred to me because of the life track that I've taken that there are, well, I guess it had occurred to me, but it really re-emphasized for me that there are many elementary school teachers who themselves are afraid of the outdoors and who are um, tremendously uh, unempowered <laughs> to take their classes outside. And I had a teacher say to me, when we looked under a microscope, it would never have occurred to me to look at a, a leaf under a microscope. Look at that, it's really cool. And I thought, wow. <laughs> so right there, I've changed the lives of a ton of kids because I got this one teacher to think that that was cool. Um, and another teacher who I later had come on a field trip uh, said to me when we, all we did was look at some stuff from a pond. That's all we did, but she said, this was like fear factor, and I did it. <laughs> and I said, you go, girl, okay? <laughs> so, um, 
So that was really an interesting thing, and it led to some relationships, and that was in the fall. In the spring, just to get that water in there again, we did have those floods. We had four months of way below normal uh, water. We had about 10% of the normal precipitation for four months, and then we got it all in one fell swoop right around Mother's Day when my own um, basement had shoes floating by. I remember <laughs> there was the floating of the shoes right before the furnace shut off. <laughs> and so uh, some of you are laughing. I under, you know exactly what I mean. But we came onto campus right at graduation. And look at that. That's um, um, what this is. Some pictures from Susan Johnson about just showing what that looked like at the time. So that was, then by June it had, um, it had resolved itself and we did a project that came out of this link with the Lynn teachers. So the Lynn Initiative and the Ford School down in Lynn and myself uh, worked to write a grant. The grant went to General Electric and General Electric funded this grant to bring a gazillion kids from Ford School and Lynn to Gordon. Unfortunately, there was just, with the MCAS scheduling and everything, there was no way to do it when Gordon's students were still here. And GE said, we'll come up with volunteers. And then suddenly I said, we need like 120 volunteers. <laughs> and they said, well, maybe we can't do quite that many. So we brought half of the group. We brought 100 kids one day and 100 kids another day in the spring. And we're going to do two more groups, another 200 kids in October 3rd and 5th. Here's some pictures of that. That's what Koi had recuperated to. There you see, you should be able to pick out Donna Loy in that picture and a GE volunteer, but there's our, our own Donna Loy, who's um, quite a lover of Koi Pond. And then here's some of the kids. The kids did, as you know, those of you who have done these kinds of projects, um, they write these little notes. <laughs> and I got these delightful letters all about how all the things that they had learned <laughs> with drawings, you know, from, from the kids afterward. But here are some. Uh, some of it was ponding. We looked at insects. And this one was interesting because it was not about living things. It was about shadows and heat. and they measured the temperature on the blacktop and the temperature when it wasn't on the blacktop and they concluded things. And the, but this is our group of engineers from just one day volunteering. There was another whole group on the other day and um, it, was, it was this really, really, really fun um, time with them and GE will be coming back to help again in, the, in, in October. Now, so that was the four each semester things. And I had two ongoing projects. One was an art and poetry contest I ran in 2004. A number of you submitted things for that. If you wondered what happened. Oh my gosh, I'm trying to click on this, but my, you'll have to go there. I, can't, I lost my. Am I on it? Yeah. Oh, you guys, you know what? It doesn't show up here. It's not like there's no hand here, but it was there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. And this just shows, oh, it's sort of going off the screen. Let me just see if that'll do it. This is the website that you can get to. It's an archive at the Center for Christian Studies. Um, site and I would point you to it because some of the poetry was really nice and a couple of uh, not everything that was submitted is here but the winners were there um, the first place photography was this and I can't blow it up it's just a gorgeous gorgeous picture the second place was a beech leaf by Donna Loy and the, the third place which was in uh, was not photography, but a painting was uh, by a, a Gordon um, student. 
uh, William Collins who painted that. So you could go to that and um, spend some more time there, especially I think with the poetry, it was just a delight. Uh, some of you will remember that I roped you into judging a variety of things and I appreciated that. That was a lot of fun. The purpose of that was to pull together all of this um, energy and excitement about the beauty around us and to make a CD. And right now I've gotten stuck. I, I asked four different art students who also knew about computers to help be a little intern and, and they all declined. <laughs> they were all busy doing their theses or something like that and I got sort of stuck because it's beyond my technical ability and so I may ask for some advice on what to do about that. But we're at a point where we've got all these resources we're trying to make a CD that has all this cool stuff on it. However, I will show you some cool pictures. Many of them were um, lent by Donna Loy, uh, who is so kind to me. And so I just give her a lot of credit for it. Some of these are her personal pictures and some of them were things from the contest. Just some really pretty pictures. Oh, man. Another view of Koi. I tried to pick a representations of big and small things. Then Stan, one of the really nice entries was from Stan Rezek, who's also been a person who's helped on a number of projects. He helped with the Science Buddies project, and he helped with another one I'll mention in a minute. And he submitted this gorgeous picture in a little haiku. This was uh, one of the submissions in sculpture, and it's Donna's uh, wooden spoon, the carved spoon from a cedar wood. It's uh, one of Donna's photos. Craig's story also submitted a lot of wintertime pictures, and again, that's a one, this is one from Donna. One from Donna. These are pines right outside of frost. Pine, white pines can live for 200 years. And then there was one other activity that we did. Um, uh, at the very end, I had completely separate from the grant planned, I had gone to physical plant and I'd said I want a native plant garden to have a place that is difficult to care for that if I could get students to plant a garden, you would like a, a garden. And they said, well, there's this rocky outcropping next to the AJ Chapel. So in a class, I had students, we mapped the whole thing. We went to the New England Wildflower Society. We figured out what kinds of plants we might include. We tried to get a grant. We wrote a grant. We didn't get it. And we just sort of said, OK, that's all we can do for now. And then. I had this opportunity to make a case that a native plant garden fit the CCS grant goals and ooh, you know, so I, um, so I could get that last little thing in there. So this was an unexpected pleasure. And in the summer, Jennifer Benina helped me. She was an instructor with us last year in biology. She helped me do um, get a lot of plants and then a number of kind people. Here you see. Dwight Schutte and Chuck Blend, and here you see several chapel office members and my kids working. Um, sorry, at the picture, these pictures are taken from Jen Benina's cell phone because we <laughs> neglected to adequately um, document several of these events. And so, um, but this was a very a lot of work here. Stan, who put in a tremendous amount of work on this. And then in, when we came back, uh, some of the orientation staff helped weed. So this is the, you saw the planting version. This is when it's already gotten far enough to have weeds. They're out weeding, several of the orientation staff helping. So we got the, uh, the native plant garden started. It's, a, it's probably a third of the knoll now and needs to 
be expanded and uh, needs some irrigation and some things. But let me ask this question. Did the CCS fellowship work? Well, I had a ball. <laughs> so yes, it did that. <laughs> And arguably, we have stronger ties to several sections of the community, especially to Lynn. We had a very, very good connection to General Electric. We connected to the conservation community. We have more information on the campus than before. I was able to sneak a little native plant garden in. And I think the biggest single thing was we took a lot of people on campus who already love land, and we strengthened ties between them so that we had a lot of efforts between faculty, staff, administration, and students. However, this summer I had a babysitter who I liked a lot, and she was a recent Gordon grad, and I said something about taking the kids down to Gull Pond, and she said, I don't know where that is. And I said, um, it's at Gordon. <laughs> and she said, well, I'm not a science type, so I didn't go in the woods very much. And I thought, okay, <laughs> I don't know what to make of that, you know. And I, when I did my art and poetry contest, we plastered posters everywhere. The day before it was due, I had my own students didn't completely know what I was talking about when I said, oh, are you going to enter anything? So there were a lot of people relatively unaffected. And the only thing that I can say is, I think these things you just have to say a lot. I think students turn over. I think, um, I think that these are things that you don't say once or do once. And that's, so I am cheerfully saying it worked fabulously. <laughs> With the caveat that not everybody even felt it, but oh well. Next in the fellowship, I'm wrapping up. I, we have Science Buddies again on October 3rd and 5th. You will see gazillions of little kids running around. We are hoping to finish the Native Plant Garden. You will probably get emails saying, if you have a spare hour, come and help me. And if you have any wisdom on how to finish this CD, I'd love some, some ideas. But it also raised some questions institutionally. Institutionally, the CCS project tied to current and future collaborations. I myself would like to see the founding of an environmental center at Gordon. We have an interpretive walk planned out. We were able to bring even large numbers of children and have them have a meaningful experience. And I think that it would meet a need. And so, that's something that may take a number of years to achieve, but I would like to see. As we get the new science center, we may consider having an environmental sciences major, but there are some gaps in our curriculum in the sciences that we need to address. In particular, we don't have geography or geology, both of which are often foundational parts of an, of an environmental sciences program. And we don't yet teach geographic information systems, which is an emerging technology used in many areas. Many people in sociology use it and humanities as well as in the sciences, and we need to include that. I myself would like to see increased research on Gordon's campus and collaborative research on Gordon's campus. I've seen, I was very heartened to see this on some other campuses. and. Um, also, when I went, I went to a conference, uh, several of us went to the ASA conference at Calvin College this last year, and they have a land stewardship uh, committee that is not just scientists, but from all across the um, campus that talks about land use management. And in particular, we need to phase invasive species management if we're going to adequately manage the Gordon and Tobacco Woods. And then I know that there is a student interest in an environmental club. So those are some of the directions that I could see us going as we work um, to be stewards. And then I'll just leave you with this beautiful picture. Thank you. Thank you.